today's <laughs> panel on the recent Supreme Court decision that affects affirmative action uh, from last summer. I have asked our moderator to be Robert Siegel. Many of you know him from his 30 plus years hosting All Things Considered on National Public Radio. Uh, he's also now a literary contributor to Moment Magazine, which is a terrific magazine, and I encourage people to check it out. Uh, we're so happy that Robert Siegel has agreed to moderate today, today's discussion. In alphabetical order, the discussants will be Emily Bazelon, who's a staff writer for the New York Times Magazine. She is also the Truman Capote Fellow at Yale Law School, of which she's a graduate. Jay Caspian Kang is a staff writer for The New Yorker and the author of the book, The Loneliest American. And Danielle R. Hawley, the former dean of Howard University Law School, is now the 20th president of Mount Holyoke College. I can't think of a group of people I'd be more excited to hear about these recent legal and also cultural and social developments from than these four. And I'm going to uh, turn it over for the next 45 minutes uh, to our moderator, Robert Siegel. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be a part of AJU Open. Uh, and thanks to our panelists, whom I will I will not refer to as discussants at any time during during the next 45 minutes. Uh, in a moment, I'd like to get to thinking about the future under the, the Supreme Court's uh, new ruling. But first, I'd like to hear about where all of you think we stand in the present. Uh, so far, how significant uh, is the Supreme Court's decision that bars colleges and universities from using, I guess, race per se as a factor in admitting uh, students are our, our uh, high school seniors and advisors do you think all uh, and uh, college admissions officers uh, uh, adjusting their sites to a very different reality uh, uh, what what's what, what's happening how how big is this let's begin with with president holly Dan danielle holly Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here with you, especially with my college classmate, uh, Mark Oppenheimer. It's great to see you. Um, and Robert, it's wonderful to finally meet you after listening to you for all these years. Um, so where are we now? I think, you know, this opinion obviously affects a number of colleges and universities, but I do want to be clear that most colleges and universities in the United States are not selective colleges and universities. So almost 4,000 colleges and universities in the United States, a small percentage of them are what we would call selective, like Harvard, University of North Carolina, Mount Holyoke. Those are the schools that we're thinking about when we think about these decisions. So many people in the United States won't be affected uh, by this decision, but we do know that many of our most important leaders um, in the United States and around the world graduate from America's selective colleges and universities. So in that way, it will have, I think, a significant impact on American life. The last paragraph of the opinion in which Justice Roberts clearly says, don't take this as meaning the opinion that we can't ever know or ask about people's uh, backgrounds and the way that their racial and ethnic backgrounds may play a part in who they are as an individual. That was one of the questions that Justice Jackson and Justice Kagan pressed on a lot during oral argument in October of 2022. And his answer in the opinion is colleges and universities can continue to ask about life experience and background, but that can't be used as a cover for seeking to fulfill a university or college's kind of idea of having racial or ethnic diversity. So I think we will see that colleges and universities are really uh, massaging the way that we ask questions on our mm -hmm. essays, um, asking people to tell us about their life experiences and the way that their life experiences have impacted them and the way that they match up with the college and university's mission, right? So many of our selective colleges and universities specifically have missions that would tell them that racial and ethnic diversity, social justice, Justice, racial justice, et cetera, are important. And having those colleges ask, ask uh, candidates specifically about mission-related activities also. Uh, Danielle Holly, thank you very much. Uh, Jay Caspian Kang, how, how do you describe where we are now? Well, I think I would echo a lot of what Danielle said in terms of um, the place where these selective colleges are. I think that a lot of them have been preparing for this for years. And so I don't think that it came as any surprise that once the composition of the Supreme Court became what it was that this type of decision would come down. And so um, everything from sort of uh, regulating whether students have to take the SAT or not, or the way in which they uh, are answering essays, the way in which different things are weighted, all this has been preparation for this type of decision. And so I don't think in terms of having a seismic impact, I don't think it'll be like in California when California eliminated 
race-based preferences and that you saw a massive drop at uh, the flagship UCs, whether, you know, UCLA or, or Cal, like, I don't think that type of drop will happen. Maybe it'll happen at some schools, but not at most of these selective schools. The thing that people are waiting for is how broad this decision is actually going to be and what the legal activists that like Edward Bloom, who brought this case, what they're going to do next. There's a lot of sort of I don't think it's fire yet, but I would say it's certainly smoke, right, about places that they're going to look at next. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think these are all just places in academia. These are places in nonprofit organizations. They're looking at sort of executive boards, these types of places to see. And, you know, I, I interviewed Edward Bloom many years ago when I was writing a article for the New York Times. He like had a, he was sort of staying at this very idyllic place on the coast in Rockland, Maine. And <laughs> He's actually, you know, I don't know, when I meet these conservative act legal activists, they're generally very polite, you know, and then very nice. So, you know, it was a, I would say it was a pleasant afternoon. But, you know, I asked him, I was like, well, what's the plan? Like, you know, I don't think you only care about college admissions at Harvard, right? And he just basically, and he said this to other people as well. He, he just says, I just think everywhere in America, there should never be a racial preference at all, right? And so my plan mm -hmm. is to eliminate them everywhere. And so, um, you know, when somebody is so forward about that type of objective, then you do one and he has this huge success under his belt. Mm -hmm. Now you do wonder what's coming next. Um, and I don't think that this is by any means the end of 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 his legal crusade. Jay Caspian Kang, thank you. Emily Bazelon, uh, what, what, what's the status quo? I think we're waiting for some other shoes to drop, both in other kinds of lawsuits, as Jay was laying out, but also in additional lawsuits in the context of higher education. Because the schools are now trying to figure out what exactly that last paragraph of Chief Justice Roberts' opinion really meant, right, as Danielle was saying. And so, you know, they have a kind of set of tests. So one test for them is they don't want to be the next school that gets sued. And one way to not be that school is to have their numbers change in some way that demonstrates that they're doing something different in the next year. At the same time, if they really believe in access to higher education that, you know, pulls in um, different racial minorities, if they really believe in that mission, there are ways to achieve that goal that lie outside of formal um, race-based preferences. I mean, Jay was talking about the UC schools and he is exactly right about the impact that banning affirmative action had in California initially, but the numbers of black and Hispanic students have come back up in California at those schools because they have figured out ways to and I should say they haven't gone entirely back up, but they've come a large part of the way back up. And that's because in California, they give some admissions preference to the kids who are the top of their high school all across the state. Um, that has been a way that other states like Texas, some quite mm -hmm. conservative states have also continued to have racial diversity. Another big part of this picture is class-based diversity. If you look at geography and then family wealth, you can do a pretty good job of having both many more low-income students who get admitted and also relatively strong percentages of Black and Hispanic students. But that would, if you really are going to increase the number of low-income kids at these top schools, you're going to change what those schools feel like and the level of privilege they reflect. And I think thus far, the schools have found that to be both a kind of threatening proposition and one that they're drawn to, like they talk about wanting that, but then I think they're wary of that for a variety of reasons we can get into. And so I'm really curious about how much socioeconomic diversity we're going to see next in response to this decision. Uh, many people, uh, it seemed in, in when, when the Supreme Court released its ruling, uh, read into Justice Roberts the elevation of the personal essay, the college essay, into the, uh, the the loophole, uh, and that this would be the the way in which the student could uh, uh, describe him or herself as someone to, for whom uh, their uh, racial identity was important in some way, perhaps in, inspirationally. So perhaps as a challenge that they'd, they'd faced. Um, uh, there was a, a, a an article recently in in the New York Times Magazine by your colleague Jess Chung. Uh, who quoted a, an admissions officer saying diversity uh, is out, adversity is in. Uh, what, 
it, 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 has the college essay been elevated to uh, to some new appearance, or as Emily says, uh, uh, Danielle, uh, are, are colleges sort of obliged to uh, to admit fewer minority students to show that they've read the ruling? You know, I think it's interesting that we're seeing a convergence of a lot of disruption in admissions, and some of it's related to the pandemic. So think how many more schools now are test optional, for example, than they were before. So it's not just this opinion that's elevating the essay, but it's also the use of test optional by many of the selective colleges and universities. I think I find one of the most troubling things about the aftermath of this case is the notion that we would expect racial minority students Students, underrepresented students to engage in some kind of adversity Olympics where they tell us how difficult it is to be a member of the racial or ethnic group that they are a part of because many of us don't experience our race as a burden or as anything that has caused us to have adversity. And I think that also intersects with the socioeconomic status point that many have made the case that we need to look more at socioeconomic status, but that was one of the factors already being used in admissions. And we know it, most of the most highly selective colleges and universities like Harvard, many of the racial minority students who are there, the Black mm -hmm. and Latinx students who are there, are actually not members of low socioeconomic status groups because of the significant residential segregation and the terrible plight of many of our public schools, many of the black and brown students who attend the most highly selective colleges and universities are middle class and upper middle class students because that is the kind of support, et cetera, that's needed to be able to gain admission. Not that there are not low income students in those groups, but I think you know, kind of matching up race with adversity or expecting that all of our black and brown students would also be low socioeconomic status, I think is a really troubling thing that the Supreme Court actually said itself in the Fisher case only seven years ago, they said, the problem is depending on socioeconomic status is that you are going to send the message that black and brown people in the space shouldn't exist unless they are overcoming some kind of adversity mm -hmm. or come from low mm -hmm. socioeconomic status back. Uh, Jay Kang, we've, we've been hearing a lot about people who who benefited, uh, have benefited from affirmative action programs. According to the Supreme Court, the plaintiffs who were, who were disadvantaged by the system uh, and uh, they were denied equal rights. Uh, to, to, to the best of your knowledge, uh, has the decision been received uh, in, in Asian American neighborhoods as, as a civil rights victory? Is it... Uh, uh, is, is it seen as a game? Would you expect to see larger numbers of Asian American students uh, being admitted to selective uh, universities? I just, I think it depends on who you ask. Uh, you know, I think that there is a, you know, I'm, I guess, part of this, right? There is a upwardly mobile sort of second generation, elite educated class of Asian Americans who are very represented in media, who are very represented in the academy. And, you know, and the, for those people, this is bad, right? Like those people generally are supportive of affirmative action. They have very sort of across the board standard progressive beliefs. And um, I think that this case made a lot of them very uncomfortable because it sort of put a lot of, I think that most of them believed as I do. And I think, you know, most people that Harvard probably was discriminating against Asian students, right? Like, I don't think that, I think the evidence on all that is quite clear, but um you know, I don't think that that class of people really matters so much, right? Like it matters if you work in the media, like me and Emily, but, you know, outside of some self-flagellations <laughs> that I performatively do, like, you know, who cares, right? Like, and the, the Academy, like, um, I think that the, the Academy itself, the character and the way in which the people in Asian American studies or people who study this stuff is changing quite rapidly, but certainly the old guard are people who would say like, we don't want to be the wedge here. We don't want to be the model minority, et cetera, et cetera, right? But within, I think, immigrant neighborhoods, specifically Chinese neighborhoods, yes, I think that this is very much pushed for. I think it's seen as a victory. And I do think that for those people who, you know, many of them are middle class or even working class, that they, that, you know, none of the particulars of this type of case ever made sense to them and that they saw clear discrimination Nobody likes to be told that they have a worse personality, right, across the board. Um, all that type of stuff in any other context would be seen as clear discrimination against any other group. And so, yeah, these people are just like, finally, we won something. Um, and whether or not you agree with that or not, I do think, you know, just to answer your question, Robert, um, mm -hmm. that for 
most working class Asian immigrants, I live in the Bay Area for people in San Francisco, for example, who are uh, Chinese American who are whether they're wealthy and living in the valley or whether they're working class living in San Francisco, like I think that there's a unified uh, celebration of the decision. Uh, Emily Baslin, since you 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 cover uh, these things, I was going to ask you about what you thought about new new litigation uh, and what might be there. But I think that the uh, the uh, the same plaintiffs beat me to it. Uh, that that uh, there's word of of a challenge to the. Uh, the, the carve out for the service academies, uh, which I find very interesting. There, there was an amicus brief that I read arguing to exempt the service academies from this rule, let them continue uh, using a, a race conscious affirmative action. And also said, and also universities that have ROTC programs because they actually produce more officers than, uh, than the service academies. Uh, is it? Do you expect the Supreme Court to actually take that case? And can you imagine the the Supreme Court saying uh, race is 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 a, is a valid factor uh, when we choose military leaders, but not when we choose doctors or lawyers or other people who who, who uh, should look like the people whom they 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 care for. Uh, I mean, what, the court what, basically already said that by creating yeah. this car, though, right? And I think there's this deference to the military. The military's leadership said very strongly that they want to have um, a kind of elite trained, you know, top college trained set of people to choose from for military leadership. And the court listened to that in a way that it no longer is interested in deferring to corporate America on. Um, you know, in the previous case from the early 2000s, Sandra Day O'Connor continued um, race-based affirmative action more broadly, and she talked a lot about briefs she received from corporate as well as military leaders. Um, this conservative majority doesn't seem to care about what the companies want, but they still seem ready to defer to the military. There's another case that's brewing in Virginia that um, is really interesting and um, potentially really significant. It involves a high school. Uh, it's Tom, I'm going to get the Thomas, the Jefferson. Name wrong. Thomas yes. Jefferson High School it goes by TJ High School. Yeah. It's a school that before 2020 did admissions in a way that was, you know, a kind of typical exam school. Like we're a public school, but we're taking the kids who do best on these tests. And it was producing a population of students with this standard that was more white and more Asian than the county it draws from. So in other words, this particular way of admitting, you know, the high and achieving kids seemed to be disadvantaging Black and Hispanic middle school students applying to high school. And in the kind of, you know, 2020 post-George Floyd reckoning, reckoning, the school changed its policies so that it's more admitting the kids from the top middle schools across the county, and they brought up the Black and Hispanic numbers. And there is a conservative challenge to that. And if you think about the implications of saying that a school cannot change its admissions criteria, it was sort of cement and freeze into place one set of admission standards as opposed to allowing for any kind of play in the joints or change that might have a beneficial effect for the Black and Hispanic applicants. And that is a real leap from where the Supreme Court came out in the Harvard and UNC yeah. cases, right? That's like a different thing to say you're stuck with doing it this one way. And you know, I feel like underlying this whole discussion and worth pointing out is some kind of quest for fairness in his mm -hmm. selective admissions that maybe just doesn't exist. Um, you know, it, it may be that there is no such perfect thing as fairness, because once you're in a, uh, the mode of um, selecting kids for something that is like desperately sought, right? It is absolutely right, Danielle, that we're talking about a small number of selective schools, but parents often when they have, you know, aspirations for their kids to be high achieving, they care a huge amount. And this is a scarce resource. This is also true about these exam schools like TJ High School. Once you're in that mode, we don't necessarily agree on how we're supposed to choose the kids for that. Like, should why should it be the kids with the top SAT scores? You can gain the SAT. Um, why should it be the kids who are, you know, disproportionately well off? Because that is something that they haven't necessarily earned either. Um, should it be the kids who write the best essays about adversity? Or is that something that you can also gain? 
Um, there is just this kind of fundamental problem here. We have lots and lots of kids who would do well at these schools, and we don't have enough spots for them. And how we allocate those spots, that's going to continue to be a really contested question in American life because of the way we have this private elite system that's different, by the way, from the way university admissions work um, in a lot of European countries or in Canada, where there isn't so much writing on whether you get into this very top echelon of schools. Yes, I should say, since I live in Northern Virginia, uh, not far from, from TJ, from Thomas Jefferson uh, High School, uh, they took the entrance exam, the, the very same entrance exam that's that's uh, taken in New York City for uh, my alma mater, Stuyvesant High School and Bronx High School of Science and Brooklyn Tech. It's the very same test. And instantly, uh, uh, TJ uh, outscored those schools in terms of uh, you know, science fair prizes and uh, national test scores. It's, it was a very academically uh, elite high school. Uh, Stuyvesant and Bronx Science and Brooklyn Tech actually got state legislators to pass a law uh, making the only way that you can admit students is uh, based on the test score. Uh, and we've seen a terrible decline in the number of, of uh, Black and Latino students admitted there. Um, is uh, what, what, what do you think about, uh, Danielle, about what, what Emily just said, that, that perhaps uh, there's no way that Mount Holyoke can, can figure out a way that is absolutely fair and uh, that achieves a desired result, which is some kind of uh, a diversity. Uh, it is, after all, the school to which, I mean, although we value diversity, two schools you've been associated with, Howard University Law School and Mount Holyoke, are schools that people go to having decided that Harvard and North Carolina's idea of diversity isn't really important to them. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe an all yeah. an all women's school is is, is more important. So, uh, can there be a real fairness uh, in in this area? You know, I think one of the things that this uh, opinion is causing is for us to ask the questions that the Supreme Court didn't ask. Um, I think there's a real his a historical and what I like to call a racial fairyland around the idea that considering race was the only way that race was in the admission system at Harvard and UNC. When we know that lots of the criteria used by colleges and universities is infused with racial implications and racial undertones. So for example, legacy admissions are a huge part of selective college admissions. Athletics is a place where we see a lot of unevenness because you have so many sports that many black and brown students don't have access to in middle school and high school. So the use of legacy admissions, use of athletics admissions, 44% of all the white students who attended Harvard at the time of this case were either legacies, athletes, or the children of staff and faculty, but mm -hmm. that is not considered to be a racial criteria while considering sure. race is one of many factors is. So I think there really is a fundamental question about fairness, but I think when we ask, you know, why should a admissions test be the criteria for you know, constructing a high school class or constructing a college or university class is what we want people to do when they graduate from high school, take more standardized tests? Or are we asking about what are we really wanting in the educational environment? But didn't didn't the colleges in, in some ways uh, bring this on themselves by using, uh, for, I mean, for my entire life, I heard complaints about the tests, uh, that the SAT was not predictive. Uh, and yet, uh, universities would use those results to determine within the within the group of white students they would admit which ones they would admit uh, very often uh, which which among the the minority students they would admit having the higher SAT scores was considered a uh, uh, a sign of some promise um, and it, it seems as if they're awfully late to ditching the test having having complained about it for for you know the better part of forty years. Yeah, I mean, U.S. News is a huge part of this. Any ranking system um, is a huge part of this. People want to be able to say, we're the number one liberal arts college. We're the number one university. And how can you judge that? They will look at standardized tests and GPA. So I think, yes, absolutely, the colleges and universities have fed this by using criteria that they know 
has racialized implications and they don't want to abandon it because it has implications for donors. It has implications for, um, for how they are considered to be publicly in the world. And I think even at Harvard, where they presented all that evidence, they never found any evidence after analyzing 480 admissions files, data over 150,000 applicants, that any Asian student would have specifically not been admitted absent discrimination, right? But they did have to admit, as Jay said, that they were looking at questions like personality, et cetera. A lot of this because they refused to minimize, I think, the role that standardized testing was playing in the system that they were using. Yes, it, I, I, I can't avoid pointing out, uh, as we're uh, in a program of the American Jewish University, that if several decades ago we were sitting around talking about people who, who protested that uh, people were raising issues of personality and character and uh, uh, preferring Idaho farm boys uh, in, in pursuit of geographic distribution, if there was a group protesting against it, it would have been, it would have been Jews. Uh, uh, and our, our producer, Mark Oppenheimer, produced a wonderful podcast series about Jews and the Ivy League, which, which documented uh, uh, what, what used to happen at, at, at elite universities. Uh, are we now, are, are, are Jews now just a different color of white? Is that it? Have we, have we ceased to, to figure independently in this, in this question at all? Or uh, uh, are, do we bring diversity? I don't, um, you know, I, I have no idea whether we've simply uh, blended in so thoroughly that we no longer have have a particular identity in this in, in this discussion. Any 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 ideas about that? I have ideas about that, but I will be channeling Mark, who is here. So maybe Mark. Maybe we should, should ask Mark up. then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm honored to be brought back in. Um, I'd be happy for any of you to channel me. I mean, yeah, it's interesting. Just from a, his, I did a lot of research on this for for the podcast Gate Crashers, as Robert kindly points out, and it is interesting how many these things were invented to keep Jews out. Legacy preferences were invented to keep Jews out because in 1910 or 1920, those with dads who had attended a given school uh, or mothers, in fact, at women's colleges were Gentiles, and so if you preferred legacies, you were preferring Christians to Jews. Um, standardized tests were pioneered by Columbia, among other places, to keep because they figured Jews wouldn't do well on them. Um, so I, I think. Look, everything Jay was saying about the celebration in going on in <clears throat> working class Chinese neighborhoods, there were certainly members of, you know, in, in some Jewish communities who felt that this would help, that the, who were celebrating this decision and that it would help bump the number of Jews, which had been much higher 20 or 30 years ago at the top, say, 20 or 30 schools, back up. Um, uh, I think that's wrong for various reasons. I actually think on the facts it's wrong that, that, uh, uh, because I think, if anything, Jews might disproportionately benefit now from legacy preferences. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And so I think Jews are in a different category than people think they're in. But, um, but you know, I, I think that the stuff about character and personality and charm, the way they pioneered grading Jews down in the 1910s and 20s, and, and how they turned that on Asians and probably have on other groups as well, certainly does rankle. I mean, I would point out that one of the things that happens in all of this discourse is it flattens out all groups, right? So it flattens out, you know, uh, it, 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 it excludes, for example, ultra-Orthodox and Haredi Jews who tend to be poor and tend to not have, be legacies and tend to not attend elite high schools. And so um, it treats them all as kind of one flat group. But I think it really raises the question of, you know, in a very profound way, whether these schools continue to be gateways for the American dream, to use the most hope mm -hmm. possible language, right? And actually, this goes back to things a few of you have said, which is, do we overvalue 20 or 30 schools in this country? You know, I mean, the American population has tripled in the past century. Have we tripled the number of schools that we think are mm -hmm. elite places? And do we and do we just simply not recognize how many, how many non-elite schools actually give terrific educations? As Robert said, in other countries, People tend not, it tends not to be the same gateway in many countries to go to one of several places. Um, so I don't know, I'd be curious to hear from yeah. all of you, like in, in your, in your own uh, college choices when you were teenagers, you know, or when you're counseling young people now is part of the message I hope my kids get is it's not just Yale and Harvard or Yale, Harvard, Berkeley and Holyoke, right? Like there are actually lots of good places. Why do Americans seem so reluctant to take, to let go of a certain school elitism, I guess, is the question I'd pose. And to spend more for it than anyone else in the world as they're, as, as, as they're doing so. Um, 
Uh, Jay Kang, what, what, what are your thoughts? Well, I think the answer is just that the people who have influence in these types of decisions all went to the same schools. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, I imagine most of the people on this call went to the same schools. And, uh, you know, I worked with Emily at the New York Times, and now I work at the New Yorker, and everyone went to Harvard, Yale, or Stanford across the board. And I went to Bowdoin. <laughs> Didn't they I, sneak you in, Jay? I went, <laughs> yeah, I went to Bowdoin, and then I was when I worked at the New Yorker in 2014, when the editors also went to Bowdoin, I was just like, yeah, it's weird. We're kind of like the least, <laughs> the least prestigious people here, you know? So, um, and, you know, people can give whatever platitudes they want to a sense of egalitarianism, but, you know, it's anyone with children will understand that, you know, people get very protective about those types of privileges and passing them on to their children. And so I don't think it's so complicated, the question of why these types of places persist. It's because people want to maintain the privileges that they had. That's why I do think that some of these schools will probably get rid of legacy admissions in the same way that Wesleyan just got rid of legacy admissions. But I think that they'll probably backdoor it in a type of way that, you know, we'll, it'll sort of be like, okay, we didn't do it, but we're going to do it. Um, but I, no, I, uh, when mm -hmm. I've thought about this for the past few years, I always sort of conclude with the same thing, which is that uh, the example I'll just give is that, you know, the university, I live in Berkeley, the University of California is a very prestigious school, right? Mm -hmm. um, but a large percentage of those students at UC and the undergrad came through a big, a very, a program in which community college students can all transfer into UC schools if they have a maintain, like a not that difficult to maintain type of grade point average. And what that means is that there is a lot of diversity at Cal that is not just racial diversity, it's socioeconomic diversity. And it's also, you know, I don't think this is, people don't think about it this way, but it's people who are older, right? People who had a different path through education than sort of killing themselves between the age of 14 and 18 to make sure that they could get into whatever schools mm -hmm. that they wanted to go. And um, when I've thought about this in a broad way, it seems like that type of system is one that we should normalize much more, right? It's uh, that type of path through education is one that would have, you know, just speaking personally, would have benefited me. I was a terrible high school student for two years because dealing with all sorts of, you know, problems that are not big problems in retrospect, but at the time felt very big to me, you know, and uh, that sort of limited where I wanted to go. But, you know, yeah. like I did well in my SATs, so it was fine. I could get into like one of these exclusive liberal arts colleges, but it was a terrible place for me to go to, you know, and I was yeah. tracked into it. It probably should have just started college at the age of 21. I think there are a lot of people who are like that and that um, when you take the issue of class into consideration and people who have to work, for example, in high school, people who have to help provide for their families, it's much harder for those students to become the type of applicants that a school like Harvard wants. And if these schools really are serious about what they say about prom promoting some sort of diversity, giving people an equal chance and not just being a place where like at Harvard, there are just as many students some from the 0.1%, not just the 1%, just many students to 0.1% at Harvard than there are from the entire bottom 20% of income yeah. earners in college. It's crazy, you know? 0.1% um, is like millions of dollars a year. Um, that, uh, if they're serious about it, then they should think about stuff like that. But, you know, I'm very skeptical that they ever will because, you know, the point of it is that like, you know, like Jared Kushner, everyone makes fun of him for, you know, like, oh, he didn't deserve to go to Harvard. Harvard exists so Jared Kushner can go to Harvard, right? Like, <laughs> okay. that's why it exists. Like, anybody who has any type of other thought about why Harvard exists, it's like delusional. Of course it exists so Jared Kushner can go to Harvard, right? Like, yeah. why else would it exist? Um, <laughs> okay. And so, I don't know, like, um, I find that sometimes, well, I, I guess I find it last year that, you know, yeah. I do find sometimes that I think I'm being somewhat impractical about these thoughts, but I think it's really like the only way to kind of- that's, that's, Well, thank you for that uh, yeah. for that take on the situation. Uh, yeah. Danielle? You know, one thing, I, I went to Yale College, I went to Harvard Law School, so I'm one of the usual suspects too. I think for me, I'm- this summer reading this case was very it was it was it was heartbreaking um because it did really erase the history of segregation in these schools right 
it pretended that these schools were always open to whoever was the most qualified. Um, my mother was born in 1945 in Galveston, Texas, when she applied to schools. And this is my mother, not my grandmother or great grandmother. She was denied um, the ability to be admitted solely because of her race, not as a factor, but solely because of her race. And at Yale, she wouldn't have been able to attend because she was a woman. And Yale didn't admit women until 1969 and didn't have Black students in any numbers until the late 1960s. So for me, going to Yale and to Harvard was a symbol of doors being opened, mm -hmm. doors that, you know, my parents never had a chance to walk through for college because they were explicitly restricted because of the racial group that they were born into. So I think part of the project that the Supreme Court is engaged in in this case is erasing the history of systemic racism against African Americans in this country. And I think colleges and universities really have to reckon with the idea of what happens if you allow your campus to become a place where Black and Latinx students are not welcome or do not feel welcome because of the admissions criteria that you've employed. And so I think it's really important for us to recognize that for many people, I was less than one of I was one of less than 100 black students in my Yale class, one of less than 50. Race conscious affirmative action was a very modest tool that allowed some of us to walk through the door and we're afraid that that door is now closed and I think that's one of one of the things that is most disturbing about this case. Emily, why don't you comment briefly and then then we'll go to some questions that have been submitted. And I think two thoughts. So one, to pick up on what Danielle is saying, is that one way to think of affirmative action is this incredibly inadequate response to America's history of racism. Like, we never had reparations. We never had historical rep reckoning. When you think about, you know, for example, the difference between the way Germany has tried to atone for the Holocaust um, to the benefit of Jews, or at least like some effort to compensate We've never had anything like that in the United States. And affirmative action just cannot do that work. And it is instead become a kind of vessel for white resentment that is counterproductive in some ways that are deeply unfair, but kind of sit there in our politics. I mean, I am also with Jay in my sense that the only way to really address these issues in American higher education would be to like radically change the whole thing so that there would, yes, there would be more schools that people felt, you know, were elite and understood that there is a good education available in lots of places, like Mark said, but also the elite schools would take a lot more kids because part of what we have here is just a simple branding problem. Um, and I should also say as someone who also went to Yale College and Yale Law School that I'm not going to sit here and tell people that that doesn't matter and they shouldn't care about it because that right. just feels like some deep hypocrisy to me. Right. Um, and in order to make the kinds of changes Jay is talking about, you know, older kids, kids with good community college records, um, public universities that have many more resources so that many of those students get the same kind of, you know, elite education, the same kind of low teacher-student ratios that we see, we'd have to just totally change the whole funding stream for how we do this. Um, we'd have to have more public funding. We would have to stop relying on, you know, some families to pay these outrageously high ticket prices for admission, um, and then these huge student loans that people take when they can't afford that. It was just like this huge system with all kinds of problems and inequities in it that is currently presenting this picture we have. And when you see it in that context, to me, taking away race-based affirmative action just feels like this small tinkering that doesn't address the underlying problems and isn't even the biggest problem with yeah. elite college admissions, which I think probably like legacy admissions would qualify for, or my personal one that drives me crazy, which are the preferences for student athletes, um, which if you look at them for elite schools end up yeah. similarly privileging white and affluent kids, because it's not really the football team, it's like the squash team. There are all these problems with it. And this is um, a place in which Justice Gorsuch's uh, concurrence was actually like quite astute in taking apart elite education. If you look at the sausage of how admissions had made these schools, it's not really defensible. But in order to fix it, you would have to change all these other things. And, and that feels like a necessary but heavy lift. Okay. 
uh, here's what Deborah Myers uh, wants to know, Dr. Myers, who's an MD. Uh, why did all the prior anti-affirmative action Supreme Court cases have a named plaintiff, like Fisher or Baki uh, et al., but there was no Asian American named plaintiff in, in this case? Do, um, either uh, Danielle Holly or, or Emily, do you know uh, why that was? What was different? Yes? Uh, Danielle, do you want to take that or I can? Go ahead, Emily, you can take it. I mean, I think that um, they didn't find someone who wanted to stand in that place. Now, I also feel like it's only fair to recognize that being the named plaintiff in a major Supreme Court lawsuit is a big burden. You have to go on television and talk about it. You have to uh, uh, give up a lot of your privacy. And in these cases with, you know, people like Abigail Fisher and um, Alan Backey back in the 70s, those people then become the butt of a lot of jokes, right? You're the white kid who didn't get in, maybe because really you were underqualified for some reason. And like people beat you up for that. Um, and you're just taking a lot of personal heat. So in our um, world of, you know, people mobbing and bullying, mobbing and bullying um, the people who stand out uh, mm -hmm. online and elsewhere. I can understand why they didn't find an A plaintiff. I am, however, also suspicious of this group that Edward Bloom created, um, Students for Fair Admissions, because they have claimed to have thousands of members across the country, but I've never seen them really substantiate that claim. And so I do think there is this question about whether that group really had standing to sue and who really, other than Bloom, was standing behind it. At the same time, I understand why an individual person didn't want to be a vector for all of the heat that was going to come their way. And I and I think Ed Bloom learned the lessons of Hopwood, Cheryl Hopwood and Abigail Fisher, which is that when you put an individual's application filed to the test, they claim that they were not admitted solely because of their race, because race was a consideration. And it just turns out to be false, right? They've been unable to establish that that was really the reason. It was really something in that applicant's own record. And I think, again, we saw a lack of trial evidence and the district courts in both cases in SSFA just found that there was no evidence, that they could not pick out a single file. So I think he probably looked for plaintiffs that um, that would stand up to the scrutiny and it's very hard to find them. And there was a lack of current Asian students to testify at the Harvard trial and at the UNC trial, but especially, I think, a lack of that at the Harvard no. trial. I, I asked him that question specifically. He said it was because he didn't want anyone to go through what Abigail Fisher had gone through. Mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that was his answer. Uh, here's a question from Jack Wasserman. Uh, has DEI, uh, that is a diversity, equity, inclusiveness, has it become an ever destructive and invasive virus in academia? Uh, Danielle Holly, do you, do you agree with that? I'm obviously the wrong person to ask this <laughs> well. question because my whole career is built on the idea that a that academia that looks like America is academia that supports um, democracy and supports what universities are meant to do. I think when we ask these questions about race conscious affirmative action, we need to step back and say, what is a university really here to do? What is a college here to do? And it's here to prepare people both for work, but also to live in the world and be great citizens of the United States and around the world. I think it's very hard to do that in racial isolation. We aren't a racially isolated country. So the idea that diversity, equity, and inclusion is some kind of, you know, pall upon academia is, is so far from reality and so far from the reality that I've lived and worked in that I'm definitely, I hope someone else on the, on the panel has a different opinion, but it's counter to my my entire life um, and the way that I've lived my life and my education and what I do on a daily basis. So definitively, the answer for me is no. <laughs> it's no. Okay. Well, here's a question from uh, uh, Kate Kazin, who writes, I have heard some Black alumni from elite and super elite institutions, I assume, uh, point out that the push to dismantle legacy admissions is coming at precisely the time that there are significant numbers of Black alumni whose own children would benefit uh, any thoughts about that? And why are we hyper-focused on colleges that educate a tiny percentage of U.S. students? Uh, only in this world is <laughs> only in this world is Bowden unprestigious, Jay. Uh, That's true. Um, I went to uh, I gave a I did a panel on Martha's Vineyard with um, and it was a lot of I, it was Henry Louis Gates and he 
before we went out, he said, welcome, you're about to meet the black bourgeoisie. And this question was asked by somebody in the audience. And it was interesting because, you know, I, I mean, just, the question is just when our kids would yeah, qualify yeah, yeah, for yeah, legacy was, admissions, yeah, now they're like, taking away legacy um, admissions. Right, right. And it was, um, I remember <laughs> when that question has been posed in the past, I think you generally react with it with a, you know, with a level of disdain you're just like oh well come on you know we still have to get it but i don't know i see the i kind of see the point of it <laughs> you know it is true that these schools are exclusively white for so long and right at the point where they diversified and that those children will go to some of these schools that they start to get rid of it i mean i don't think that it's intentional in any type of way but there certainly is an irony there about it i think you know you know we're running out of time uh and i think i have only enough time to to point out first that skip gates uh did not go straight to Yale. He went to, I believe it was Frostburg State first uh, and uh, did well enough to be spotted by a professor and, and he, he transferred. Also the president of the US went to the University of Delaware and the speaker of the house went to UC Bakersfield. So the, the, and, and the national leadership is not exclusively from Harvard and Yale. Mark Thank Oppenheimer. Goodness. Thanks, that's <laughs> right. Um, uh, it's true. Uh, the recent Ivy League educated presidents have included Donald Trump from the University of Pennsylvania, if I'm not mistaken, right? And yes. uh, yeah, uh, Barack Obama went to Columbia, right? Although he didn't start there, if I, right? He uh, started at, at Occidental and transferred, yes. Um, thank you so much. This has been a real treat for me. Uh, Robert Siegel, thank you for moderating. Emily Bazelon, Danielle Hawley, Jay Caspian Kang. Um, I you know, I have I have no way to sum up except to say that these this is has been an education for me as someone here who has neither written on this subject nor gone to law school nor had to grapple with it in my professional capacity as as somebody who's covered you know religion. Although of course you know as you pointed out, there's a history, a religious history there as well. The yeah. last thing I would say is I'm entirely uh, responsible for all opinions uh, here. If you have any angry emails, send them to Mark Oppenheimer at aju.edu, and I will you know process them in this the Jewish New Year. Uh, Happy New Year to those who observe. Um, happy fall to all of us and uh, and thank you so much for for joining AJU over.